and I think we're good to go then. So, more functions. So three lecture set of slides, we're on the second lecture now. Last time we talked about uh, just how to make some. Got your return, type, void if there is none, name of the function, parameters in between parentheses, curly braces to give the body, and then optionally, if your function needs to give back something, you, you better be returning something of that type. Okay, we talked about some common issues, but now that we can have multiple functions and start calling them and we know how to make them, I want to talk about something called the stack. Okay, you will hear this uh, called so many different things, but the word stack is in all of those things. It's sometimes called the call stack or the runtime stack, the function call stack. I'll just say the stack, probably, uh, but I'll probably also use these interchangeably if I feel like it. Okay, so this is a new concept, and it's going to help us understand, like, what in the world is happening when I call a function. I'll try to answer these questions for you. And also, how does C++ know when I call a function, how does it know to come back to, like, the, the next line or the rest of the computation? Which is kind of cool. So, like, if we have, well, our example function here was called square. If we had main call square, how does square know to go back to main? What if there's like another function, cube or something? How does it know to not go there? The stack will tell us, all right? So let's talk about that. So yeah, it is a little diagrammatic way to express how functions are being called and how they return, all right? So uh, every time a function gets called, it gets pushed, we say, onto this magical thing called the stack. And that remembers where we came from, all right? The stack is how functions know where to return to. And it also, inside of the stack, for main, for a function call, I call those stack frames for every function. Every function has its own memory for its local variables. You can have an x in square, you can have an x in main, they're different x's, okay? And then when a function returns, we have to, give, we have to go back to the previous function that called it, and we say that we pop that function off the stack once it's done. Okay, so pushing and popping, you'll hear those terms a lot in computer science. I don't know who came up with them, but push is when you add something, pop is when you remove something. Okay, it's like it's a bubble. So here's my example. So let's say that we have uh, main, the main function, and it's the very first function that gets called whenever any program runs. So here's like a stack of dishes. Boop, 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 I'll draw it like this. And the very first dish is main. So I'll draw it like this. That, this is a stack frame to represent the fact that main got called. Okay, so that's the stack drawing. So now we're in main. And then main, somewhere in, inside of it, it calls the sum function. And so I will save that idea in the stack. I'll push a new frame for the sum function. And this is telling me I'm inside the function called sum right now. But when I'm done, the person that I return back to is main. That's kind of what's going on inside of the computer. It's remembering those things through this stack. And then maybe sum calls square. And then both of those return. Square returns back to sum. Sum returns back to main. That's the idea. So main has called sum, and sum is working, and it called square to do its thing. Okay? So a bunch of functions calling other functions. Right now we're running square, but square, once it's done, it will return back to sum, and sum, once it's done, We'll return back to main. The person below you on the stack tells you who you return back to. And all of these places maybe have their own local variables. Maybe main has an x local variable. That's where the local variables really live. They live in the stack, this place called the stack. They live in main stack frame. Maybe main has an a variable, a b variable. They all live here. I've just been drawing them in the ether. But this is where they really live. And then maybe sum has some variables also called a and b. They're separate. You can have different name. You can have the same name for different things in different functions. They're separate places of memory. Uh, maybe square has its own little x variable. So that's where memory lives as well. And then also, once square is done, it needs to return back a value. It remembers who's below it. It, it just looks below it on the stack. It's like, okay, I need to return this value back to sum once I'm done, and I'll pop myself up. Okay, so really, square goes away. Now sum is the only thing on top, but I'll just draw slashes so that you can see it after we're done. And then once sum's done, it needs to return back to main. It knows because that's beneath it. And it pops itself off the stack. All of its memory goes away. Now we're back in main. 
running stuff. Okay, so each function has its own memory for its local variables, and that allows us to have the same name, reuse those same names for variables, and not be ambiguous. Like once we're in some A and B means sums A and B. Then when we're back in main, A and B mean mains A and B. Okay, so that is very probably vague and generic. Uh, is there anything that's jumping out at you that makes no sense at all about this? Because I will draw many stack diagrams from now on. It'll give us some examples of real code that we do write. Am I good with that? All right. Let's see how do I want to do this. Ooh, there's so many, so many programs to make today. So the next thing that I want to talk about now that we have this idea of local variables with, with the same name. These variables, they go away when the function returns. I better teach you about scoping. Global, scope, lifetimes of variables, all these things, okay? The difference between a local variable and a global variable. So uh, I'm going to use Harry Potter as an example. Maybe I should, like, pick a new example because maybe we're not millennials anymore. But... Here's the idea. If you have not watched or read the fourth Harry Potter book, I'm about to spoil it for you, so you can plug your ears if you'd like. But this dude's name is Cedric. He dies. Okay. We're going to use this idea as, uh, as an example. So Cedric is going to be a local variable. We're going to make a local variable called Cedric, and he's going to die before the program ends. But Harry Potter, of course, the boy who lived, he's going to be a global variable. He's going to live for the life of the program. Okay? So... That's my silly example for this. Local versus global. Let me show you what that means. I better connect to the terminal if I want to show you something. Let's see. What are the odds that this didn't restart on me? Very low. I do not have a mouse. <laughs> okay. Well, at least it highlights itself. We'll figure this out together. There it goes. Sure. Uh, Alright, there it is. That's fun. Do I get a mouse back if I go over here? I have legitimately lost my mouse. Do I get it back if I use this? Oh, there it goes. Cool. Maybe I do need to restart this again, though. Well, that's sure taking its sweet time. Probably having issues with... Oh, did it not? Did it not start? What in the world? No, uh, it's probably because I clicked it so many times. There it is. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think this force restarted itself. Sorry. I can't control the updates. There we go. And then what are we today? I think we're lecture 12. Yeah. Okay, now I'm where we need to be. So vim, let's call it local versus global dot cdp. All right, so here's the idea. Uh, if you make a variable outside of any function, it's called a global variable. All right, so in Terry Potter, he's going to have 42. This is a global variable. It lives forever. Anybody gets to use it, it lives for the life of the program. It's a very fancy. It lives for the life of the program. Okay, so Harry Potter lives forever. And... Uh, so I can talk about him in main, of course. I can be like, Harry Potter++. plus plus. He's accessible in any function, including main, of course. Let's see how Harry Potter, whatever I want to do with a global variable I can do. But if I were to make a local variable, it would go away when that function returns. So let me make a function called Goblet of Fire, because that's the name of the book, slash movie. And that function is where I'm going to create a local variable called Cedric. Okay, that's the name of the 
the dude who does not live so in his Cedric, Cedric, maybe his value is 8 or something. This is a local variable. Anything that I make inside of a function could be main, could be some other function. This is called a local variable. Alright, it only lives as long as the function lives. It lives only as long as the function lives. So once this function returns, all of its memory goes away. Alright, so I can say Cedric++. plus plus. Totally fine. I can see out Cedric up here. He's alive right now. We're good. And then I can also do Harry Potter stuff, because he, of course, is a global variable. He, he lives for the life of the program. He's accessible anywhere. I can talk about him in here, too. Okay, so that's all well and good, and this is a normal program. All right, it's going to print, uh, and I'll draw stuff in a second. Let's see here. Yeah. Let's run it. We get uh, 9, 43, and 44, and that hopefully will make enough sense once I draw it all for you. So here's the idea. I had the stack, of course. I make no local variables in main. So main just exists. And then there's also a separate place in memory for my global variables. They live for the life of the program, so they can't be a, a part of any function's memory, right? So that's where Harry lives. Harry Potter, who I set to 42. And then we go to main, right? Main first runs Goblet of Fire, so that means I just called Goblet of Fire from main. Goblet of Fire. Well, that's a stack frame. And it makes a local variable called Cedric. Makes him 8. Cedric, that's where it lives inside of its stack frame. 8. And then I print, uh, or I make him 9. And then I print Cedric. So that's the 9 printed on the terminal there. I see 9, and then I go and I access Harry Potter. So Harry Potter++, plus plus, that makes him over here, global variable, 43. Print the 43. Boop, that's my 43. And then I return. Goblet of Fire returns back to whoever called it onto the next line of main. That one's done now. We're, we're, we're back down to here. So this goes away along with all of its memory, along with Cedric. So Cedric has died. Sorry, Cedric. So now we're back here, we can talk about Harry some more, because he, he's a global variable, he lives forever. So we can make him 44, and we can print 44, totally fine. That's why you see all this, okay? One thing that you cannot do is the following. Down here in main, try and print Cedric. Okay? This is not even going to compile. Cedric is not a local variable to main, it was a local variable to... Goblet of Fire, right? That's where Cedric was born. That's where he lived. He's gone now. Main has no Cedric. Once that function returns, all of its memory goes away. Cedric was not declared in this scope. Okay? So that is very unfortunate. And of course, the reason why we can't do that is Cedric is already dead. Right? Any questions about that idea? We have global variables. To define them outside of any function. They live forever. Life of the program. You can access them anywhere. Local variables are ones defined inside of functions. All the variables we've made so far have been local. Maybe just to main, though. But they really live for as long as the function lives. Secretly, main local variables are kind of like global variables in a sense. You can't access them other places, but at least they live forever. Because main, once main returns, the program's over, right? So that's something to think about as well. But uh, did this example make enough sense? Global variable versus local variable. Lives for the life of it versus lives for the function call. Goes away when the function returns. All that memory disappears. Are we happy with that? All right. The next thing that I want to talk about is... Wait, why do I have an extra slide here? For no reason. There we go. The next thing that I want to talk about is references. It's an idea that's going to help us talk about somebody else's variables, which is cool. We can actually let some other function access means variables if we 
tell them nicely that they can. Okay. So this is going to answer these questions. How do I modify the variables that I pass, the original values that I pass to a function, if you want to do that, if you want to pass them along as variable values? How can I make that happen? I'll show you how. References can do that. Also, how can I return multiple values at once? References can do that, too. Because no, uh, most functions, right, they return one thing. It's like, you're giving me back a double. You're giving me back an int. You're giving me back nothing at all. If you want to return two things, three things, can't, can't, you cannot yet do that, and I will show you how you can, right? References solve all these problems. So let me talk to you about references. So here's what a reference is. A reference is just a way to give another name to an existing variable. It's an alias. It's like a code word, code name, right? It takes up no memory of its own, which is technically a lie, but just go with it for now. It really, you can think of it as taking up no memory of its own. And to make a reference, use the ampersand in a type, an int reference, we say, double reference. So here is a normal variable, int x equals 42. That makes the x variable, holds 42. I can make a reference to x like this. I say int reference, that's the type. Now it has an ampersand in it. Kind of read, read it in this order. It's an int reference. Int reference, I don't know, let's give another name for x, let's call it z this time. Int reference z equals x. So this fancy line, what it does is this. It gives another name to the same box in memory, which is weird. Z is a reference to x, we say. It's not a new int. If we didn't have the ampersand, it would just be a brand new box in memory, a new int, right? But no, if we use the ampersand and then immediately give a value, we're renaming x. We're giving it a new name. x is a reference, and you still have the x too, to x. Okay? z is a reference to x. So now I can say z and or x, and they both do the same thing. So if I were to say z++, that's equivalent to now saying x++. They have, it's the same uh, box, different name. Which is weird to think about. Uh, let's see, how do I want to talk about that. Let me, I don't know. Let's just go straight to an example. I'll draw things eventually. So here it is. Let's say int x equals 42 like it was. And then int ampersand z equals x. So this is saying that z is a reference to x. They're the same place, just different names for the same place in memory. Same box. So I can see out x It'll print 42. I can see out Z, of course. It'll also print 42. They're the same place. I can say X plus plus. That will make X slash Z 43. That'll print out 43 twice. I could also say Z plus plus. It's the same box in memory, just with a different name. And that'll print 44 twice. They're really the same place. They're equivalent. It's just a renaming. So I get 42, 42, 43, 43, 44, 44. They're all in lockstep. They don't differ. They're the same place. Just different names for the same place. That ampersand means this thing that you're defining is not a normal int. It's an int reference. It's a reference to an int, some other int. It's a new name for an existing place. Z becomes X. X becomes Z. Any questions about that? It's a weird little concept. But it's going to prove to be very powerful. Oh, and by the way, this ampersand, you can put it anywhere. I think of it as the type. It's like the name of the type. So I usually attach it to the end of the type int, double, double ampersand, char ampersand, then the space, x equals y. But it really makes no difference. You can put it in the middle, put some spaces around it. Uh, to the left, to the middle, to the right. Some people do it like this, next to the variable name. C++ doesn't care about white space, so you can do this. It makes no difference. They're all int references. Okay, I'm going to try and do this first one, in this class at least. So yeah, that is references. Let me give you another example, just for fun, and I'll draw it this time. So int y equals 42. That makes the y box, holding 42. Do stuff with y if you want to. 
And then I can come along and say int reference x equals y. So that makes a new name for the same box of memory. Now I could say x something, y something, they do the same thing. So I could say y plus plus as usual, that makes it 43. I could say x plus plus because that's the same box. It will affect that value, make it 44. All right. If I see out uh, x, that's going to print 44. Just like if I see out y, it'll also print 44. It's just going to that box. I just have two names for the same box. Very odd. Any questions about references? Mm -hmm. That's exactly where I'm going on the next slide. So that was a great segue question. If you have just a normal function, like just use X or just use Y. There's no real need to make a reference. Uh, the, the answer lies in function calls. We can make parameters of a reference type. And that's what we're going to do. Yeah. They are the same. Of course it does. So Y plus plus. That did the equi that was equivalent to saying x plus plus. They so both. Up. Yep, one made it 43, then the next made it 44. They are both the same. They're talking about the same box in memory, just two names for the same place, same value at the end of the day. Any other questions? Yeah. So the reason you want to use references usually are with functions in parameters. So let's talk about how functions get called. All right. What happens on the stack when you pass a value to a function if it takes an argument or multiple arguments? Here's how I will explain it. Let's pretend that there is some sort of interfunction dreamland. That's what I'll call it. Where the parameters are getting initialized to the arguments because they're just variables at the end of the day. So uh, I'm going to make two functions that are silly. Uh, they're called, I'll just make them an increment function. One is going to be called by value. One is going to be called by reference. Okay. And I'll explain what those two terms mean as well. So here we go. And that will help explain what's happening when you pass something to a function. Okay. So call. So we're going to name call by value and reference. I'll show you both in the same file. Okay, let's make a variable int x equals 42. Let's have an increment function, inc by val, I don't know, x, and then we'll see out x. How do I want to do this? Yeah, that's about right. And then I'll make another function that is going to increment it by reference. Ref x. See out x again. Okay? So here are these two functions. Uh, they're both void functions, they just do something. Inc by val. Let's say that it takes a, a parameter uh, called a, okay? So the, the argument x is going to be placed into a when we call this function. And so this, all it's going to do is just take its a and increment. Yeah? And then I'll do another one by reference. Void inc by ref. This is not going to take an int a. It's going to take a reference to an int called a. Okay? And it'll also do a++. Would you like to take your bets as to what is going to be printed by this program? What do you think you'll see after I call this? It does A++. What will it print here? What do we think? What are our options? Yeah, I think it might print 43. That seems logical. And then if you do it this way, it takes, a weird, it takes X in a weird way, I think it'll make it 44, right? If it's already 43. Two ways to do the same thing, maybe. This first call did nothing. Still 42. Even though it did A++ up here. The second call actually changed X. And that is the whole point of references. That is why I'm teaching them to you. So let's, let's unpack that. So remember these implementations. One took a normal int, incremented it. One took an int reference, incremented that. And I call them with X down here as the argument. 
Okay, here we go. So the first function was called call by value because it passed along just a normal int. All right. When you use a function and you just pass along a regular variable without any ampersands or anything, you are making a copy of that variable. So when you hear the word call by value, just think of the word copy. Copies get made. Okay. And so here's what's going on when I ran increment by value, when I run this function. So we're in main. You know about local and global variables. You know about the stack now, so I can draw these things. Main has an x variable that it sets to 42. And then we call inc by val. Oop. Inc by val. And inc by val has an a variable, right? It has its own little a variable. It's an int. It's just a, a parameter is technically a variable that belongs to that function. It's just initialized in a very fancy way. It's initialized in this interfunction dreamland. So secretly, you can think of it like this. This a is getting initialized to whatever I'm passing along as the argument, right? I'm passing along x as the argument. So somebody secretly, in between function calls, because those variables don't exist at the same time, somebody secretly somewhere is doing int a equals x. Does that make sense? That is how that a parameter is getting made. Somebody's doing int a equals x. Doesn't make sense because those are from different uh, functions, but it works out in the interfunction dreamland, let's say. All right, so that's how a is getting initialized, and then it's pretty obvious to see that a is going to be 42 now, right? Whatever x was. And then, of course, a++ is going to do this, make 42, 43, and then we return back, because that was all we did. That's our entire body. We're back down here to ready to print. Did we touch x at all? No, of course not. A was a copy. It's just another int, another variable that belonged to another function. Are there any questions about that? That's why the first function did nothing. When we passed along x, we put it into a parameter named a that was its own place. Separate. You can think of a parameter as a local variable, really. Just a special kind of local variable. And that will also tell us why the other one really did set it. Because we were back in main again, right? X was still 42. And then we called ink by ref. And for reasons, I'm going to draw uh, everything that belongs to ink by ref in green. Ink by ref. And it has its own parameter called A, but it's a reference parameter. And so it's being initialized to, to the argument, right? We're giving along x as the value of a. So in the interfunction dreamland, a is getting initialized in this way. Somebody's saying int reference a equals x. What does that mean in terms of boxes? Do I make a new box with a reference? I definitely do not, right? So this is A. Boop. That's why I had to use green, a different color. So now A is X. It's main's X. It's a different place. Or sorry, it's a different name for the same place because it's a reference. That's how it's getting initialized. There is no A up here. It's just another name for main's X because it's a reference. And that is why I can do A++ and modify X. That'll make it 43 here. That is the beauty of it all. And then, of course, this is going to return. A no longer exists. But X is memory of somebody else. That's still there. That's still sitting in main now that we're back in main, ready to print the new value. So yeah, this is like int A equals X. It's a new variable. This is int reference A equals X. That's how you're passing along these, these arguments to these parameters. And this one is, and that should be uh, a bit more logical, why this is actually changing X making an alias, not a brand new copy. So I get 42, 43. What questions do we have about this? This is a complicated little topic. Does it make enough sense? I thought you changed somebody else's variable. All right. 
So another reason to want to use references is when you're passing along something to a function, it's not copying anything, right? It's just giving another name for the thing that's already there. That saves a lot of memory, especially if you're passing along huge things. Let's say you want to give a vector to a function, right? Maybe that vector has a million elements. That's a lot of space being taken up, a lot of bytes of memory, right? If you were really calling this function by value, you'd be passing along a vector of ints, and it would have to copy it. It'd have to make its own local version of that same vector so that it could work on it, right? That's what call by value does. It makes copies. That's no fun. We don't want that. We don't want to do that. If we used a vector int reference, we just have another name for that existing giant vector. We don't have to make a copy of it. No copying. And that will save memory. A lot of memory. And if it's a very large vector, you can imagine that it takes a lot of time for the computer to copy it over as well. So it'll also save you time. So when, in, when you can, as a parameter, always make it a reference if you can. Are there any questions about that idea? Because we know now that things get copied when we pass them to functions if there isn't a reference involved. We have a new box in memory, like it's a copy of that thing we passed. If we have large things, it's best to not copy it. Okay? With that, I think we're ready for a question. Seems like we're doing good enough. Here's my question for you. Here are five lines. Run them in your mind, please. What does memory look like once they're all finished? Okay? So let's go to the buy clicker page and then I'll stop attendance after we're done with this. So please do attendance if you have not. Please go to your buy clicker page, get together as a peer instruction group, and I'll give you like, I don't know, two or three minutes to think about what is memory going to look like when all those lines are done? A, B, C, or D. Prove to me that you understand references. All right, give you a couple minutes. And yell at me if you have any questions about the question. All right, that was my timer. Do we need more time? Did we come up with a good answer? A good guess, at least? So take a few more seconds to get your guess in. Maybe till 45. We'll go back to the slide. Which one do you think? And then we'll talk about it. Then we'll show you a trick to immediately get the answer if you're very confused on a test.
All right, let's see what we're thinking. Ooh, look at us. Majority is saying C. Very nice. C is the answer. Let's figure out why. So int x equals 42. There's no ampersand. It's making a box. It's making a box called x. Setting it to 42. Int ampersand y equals x. That's making a reference. It's renaming an existing box. It's giving a new name to an existing box. So now this is called y as well. Okay? Int z equals y. Is this a reference? Is there an ampersand anywhere in that line? Uh-uh. So it's making its own box. It's making a brand new variable, right? A brand new variable called z. It just so happens to be set to a value of an existing variable. 42. And ampersand p equals z. So reference, p is a reference to z. That's giving a new name to z. Int reference q equals y. That's giving a new name, right? It's a reference. Q is another name now for y, wherever that is. So that's this one. Do we see why that is the answer? If there isn't an ampersand, it's making a box. If there is an ampersand, it's renaming an existing box. So it's giving a new name, by the way. I maybe shouldn't say the word rename. Are we good with that? Does it make sense why that is the answer? Why C is right. We, we all got it at least those of us who submitted our answer. If you ever get this on a test and you're very confused, here's a very easy way to figure out the answer, figure out which one is the same box. What you do is take all the names that you have, x, y, z, p, and q, and set them all to different values. Be like x equals 43, y equals 44, z equals 45, p equals 46, q equals 47. Set them all to different things and then print them all out. Whichever ones are the same values, those are the same box. Does that make sense? Because this, this line will set all of them to like those values. It's like the last one will have set that entire box to everything. All these different names will get set to the same value, the same different value. Okay, so that's one way to solve it if you are uh, struggling. But uh, it seems like we understand how it's working. Are we good to move on? All right, so let's see. Did that one, did that one, did that one? Cool. The next thing that I want to show you, and this will be, I think, the last major topic of the day, is multiple files. Because now, main got really long, we introduced brand new functions, now we can make a bunch of functions. But then, we make a bunch of functions, and now our files get really long. Right? Still, there's a lot of code to scroll around between. Okay, So maybe it would be nice if we didn't have to put all of our code in one giant CPP file. Okay, And I think you can imagine if you're making any kind of software for a company, they're not making their program in one huge CPP file, right? Millions of lines long. No, they're splitting it up between files. They're logically separating different things into different files. And so here's how you do that. You use, of course, .cpp files to implement stuff, but there's also this thing called a .h file. It's called a header file. So header files end in .h or .hpp or .hxx. There's a million options. I'll use .h in this class because that's what your book uses. And then implementation files, they all also have the same extension, but uh, they'll have the same name, but the different extensions. So .cpp is the one I'll use because your book uses it, but you could alternatively, G++ doesn't care, you can name your files uh, .cc, .capital C, .cxx, these are things that people use. Uh, like Google likes to use .cc instead of .cpp for their C++ files. It's all up in the air which one's best. But I'll use .cpp and .h, and this is what you do. Let's say uh, we want to make our own library. Right, that's how you do it. You make your own file that you can then go and include. That's the beauty of it all. Okay, So here is foo.cpp. It implements the foo and bar functions, because why not? There's a foo.h that corresponds to it, and that's where you just declare the fact that those functions exist. 
because that's all a user of your library needs to know about. They need to know how, how to call the functions. They don't care about the implementation. All right? So in the .h file, that's where the declarations of your functions go. Decals of funks go here. All right. And then in the corresponding CVP file, so it's foo.h, that means there's a foo.cvp that implements all of those declared functions. Funks defined in the .h file get implemented in the .cvp file. Are implemented in the .cpp file. Or I should just say here. Or implemented here. All right. And then you've got yourself a library. You got a function just for foo stuff. And what you do is you include that wherever you need that functionality. You you can include yourself now. You've made your own separate file. Uh, you don't use the angle brackets like include IO stream, include vector, all that stuff. That's just for the system libraries, the stuff built into C++. If it's our own files, we use the single quotes. So if main wants to use the foo library, we're going to include the header file, include foo.h in between quotes. Okay? That's how you do it. And then also customarily in your, in your implementation file, you also include your header file. Eventually you'll see why that is useful and necessary, but just do it for now. It's not particularly necessary yet, but it's a good habit to get into. Not going to hurt you, that's for sure. Uh, and then, once you've got all your files separately, right, you only need to compile the implementation files, and I'll show you why in a little bit. Oh, there's one place where I forgot to remove that. Nice. You just say G++, and then both of your implementation files. Foo.cpp main.cpp. That's where all the code lived. The header file is kind of extra. It just has declarations. You don't need to compile that. You don't need to give that to G++. But all the implementation files, you need to give them all at once to G++ so it can find all those implementations across all those files and make you your executable file. Okay? Which is beautiful. Then in main, you can call foo. You can call bar. All that stuff. Give all the implementation files. Okay? I'm about to show you an example, but is any of that extra confusing? before I get to one. Separating stuff into multiple files, this is essentially you making a library. All right, so here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to take something that we already wrote. Remember that sum of squares stuff? That was a long file. I'm going to convert that into a library, a sum of squares library. All right, so let's go back to that. Let's, uh, let's copy it all here. Uh, I don't want to do that. So let's copy lecture 11's sum of squares.cpp here. And remember all the stuff that was going on. We had our function declarations, we had our main function that used those functions, and then we go and we implemented all those functions that we declared up there. Add, square, sum of squares, all that stuff. So that's a pretty long file. Let's separate it. Let's separate it into a main function that uses all this stuff and then a library that implements all these extra things. Okay, so in the main file, we don't have to really look at all of those declarations or that implementation. So I'm going to make three files total. I've already got one. I'll just move some stuff from it. Let's have a main.cpp file that holds our main function. And that's it. <laughs> Then, in sum of squares.h, we're going to put our declarations of things. That's what you do for a library. You put the declarations in a header file, in a .h file. Decals of sum, square, sum of squares, all that stuff. Okay. And then, in the cpp file with the same name, we're going to implement all those things. Implementations of. All that stuff. Okay? That's the idea. So I'm going to make those three files now in this style. Main function, CVP file that implements things, header file that declares things. Okay? So, all right. These are the things that should go in my header file, right? Those are the declarations of those sum of squares library functions. So, sum of squares dot h will hold just those. Boop. 
So function declarations go in the .h file. And you know what, actually, just so that I can separate all this for you, uh, let's put all this into another folder. Let's, uh, let's call this a, uh, let's make a sum of squares folder. So that I can just write everything inside of that. So let's move sum of squares dot everything into sum of squares. Okay, so now inside of my sum of squares folder, I've got all these things. So back to the the header file. All right. So all the function declarations they go here. That's all you need in the header file. All right. Then I'm also going to have a main file that includes my header file and uses my library functions. I'll call that main.cpp. So that's going to take the entire main function here, which was all this stuff. Here I am using my sum of squares function, right? And to have access to it, I need to include the header file. Include, and the name of it is going to be sum of squares.h. That's what I called it, right? So I've got these three files now, sum of squares h, the header file that I include when I want to use my library. And so now it's going to understand that this function exists and I can use it. It's part of the library. And then I have the main function here with the main, uh, sorry, the main file with the main function, including that library, using the stuff. And then finally, in sum of squares.cpp, I include all of the implementations, all the stuff in the header file. So here's the header file. I need to go and implement everything in sum of squares.cpp. Okay. And here are all the implementations. Implementations of everything in the .h file go in through here. Okay. And customarily you include that header file as well. Include sum of squares.h, even though it's not strictly necessary right now. Eventually it will become necessary. Okay. So that's it. Those are your three files that you make. I don't know the best way to show them all to you at the same time. Uh, here's my best. Oops. Uh, here's the best I can do. There's the main function, including all our stuff. There's the header file that's making all of these, declaring all these functions. Here's the CPP file implementing all those functions customarily including its header file. And then there's the main file, main.cpp, that is including our library and using our library. Okay, so those are the three files. Any questions about that? I've just split them up. Now if I want to run this program, if I want to compile and run this program, I compile only the implementation file, so only the CPP file. So I'm going to say g++ main.cpp, sum of squares.cpp. Forget the dot .h. I'll just call it, I don't know, main or something. And that's going to bring in all the implementations and make me an executable program called main that runs this function that's not implemented in this file. It's implemented in the implementation file. It's really nice. Enter n, I don't know, n is 10. 385. Okay. Any questions about that? I've just taken what we did and I've split it up into three files. Header file, CPP file, use of the library file. Definitely study that. There's a lot going on there. The reason you don't have to compile with the header file, you don't have to include like g++ sum of squares h and then sum of squares .cpp, is the following. When you include a file, and this works for the like IO stream and vectors as well, when this is what happens. When you number sign include a file, because it really is secretly a file sitting somewhere just in a special place for the built-in libraries. When you include a file, it gets copied and pasted to wherever you said include. It gets copied and pasted. 
So this line is getting replaced with the entire contents of this header file. When I say include it, it's copying and pasting everything there. Okay? That's, that's why you don't have to ever compile with it. It's already secretly getting itself in there anyway. All right? So it's secretly getting included twice if you have it here too. But that is no issue. All right? So, yeah, even include IO stream, that's a file. It's just getting copied and pasted right below, right above your main every time. You just haven't needed to care about that until now. Okay? Are you good with that? It's a weird little idea, but that is making your own little libraries. There's one last thing I need to show you that has to do with inclusion. Because things get copied and pasted when you include a file, things can go wrong when you do things in a weird way, okay? I'm going to show you just a very easy way to make the wrong thing happen, but it's a lot more subtle in real life. I promise you that. This will eventually bite you. Here is the issue. I can do this. What file is this? Sum of squares.h. What am I doing? What am I including? Sum of squares.h. It's going to copy and paste this file into itself when it compiles. It needs it. Okay. That's a little weird. It'll try and make an infinitely sized file, right? It's going to keep on copying and pasting because it's going to be like, all right, I will copy and paste this entire file into right here. There you go. Oh, I see my inclusion again. I better copy and paste this entire file into right here. Oops. It's essentially going to do this. Boop, boop. There you go. Oh no, I need to copy and paste my entire file again. So the include is never going to get rid of itself. It's just going to keep being copied and pasted. And then I'm just going to make an infinitely sized file if I do this. It's called infinite inclusion. We don't want that. But yeah, here's what's going to happen if I compile this. Now remember that main's including this file. So I'm going to It's going to get copied into main, for example. This one. It's going to copy and paste all this here, which is then going to copy and paste the file some more and some more and some more. Oop. And so, yeah. Include nested depth 200 exceeds maximum of 200. It's like error from the same file a million times. It's just going to... File included from, included from, included from, included from. Infinite inclusion. And it gives up after a little while. So that's no fun. If you don't want that to happen, and it is possible for it to happen in real life, it's just files including other files, which then include other files, which includes you again. That's how it really happens usually. You include what's called a header file guard. That, that makes it so this, that this does not happen, okay? These three magical lines that also start with number signs. You just wrap that around your header file, the entire contents of your header file, and everything will work out, okay? That makes it so you can't be copying and pasted forever. What this does, what these three lines do, is they make a compiler level if statement. This is for the compiler. This is not C++ anymore. It's very weird. It makes a special compile time variable to keep track of whether or not the header file has already been included. So it's like, if this weird name, this weird capitalized variable that comes from the name of the file, that's how you do it, you make it the name of the file, if that has not already been defined, well, here I am defining it. And then here's like the closing brace for an if statement. It's a compiler level if statement. And so if it's already seen a definition of this foo h thing, and this gets included again, it's just not going to look any further. It's going to skip over this compiler level if statement. I can imagine how weird that is to read right now. So this is just one of those few things that you have to memorize until it starts making sense. But this is what you do. And this will stop infinite inclusion in its tracks. It's going to be if and def, and then you use the name of the file, so like sum of squares. You can have a dot and a variable name, so you use an underscore usually. If it's not defined, sum of squares h, define it to be emptiness. And then you give everything else, and then you say end if. Oop. And now suddenly, as if by magic, everything works all over again. 
because the second this got defined, we included it once, this got copied and pasted one more time, but we didn't hit the body of this if statement because sum of squares h has already been defined previously. Ooh. That's the weird way that that works, but uh, it works. Let's see, what else do I want to say here? So yeah. Usually you wouldn't need this anymore, but uh, you can have it now. It'll still work. It'll compile, it'll run. Those are called header file guards. Wee. Any questions about that? It'll make sense the more you use it. And if I give you a header file, I'll just do this for you. That's what happens. It keeps you from doing infinite inclusion. All right, are we ready for one last example? Let's do it. Extended example. All right, let's make a counting program. Remember that I did a little bit of that before? A little counter program that models a counter that you click. We're not yet ready to write that original program. That still needs things called classes. We don't have those yet, but we can do it with functions right now. Not a problem. So let's make a counter library. A counter uh, with some functions, the main function, all those things. So here's, here's how we'll do it. All right. We're going to model one of these little counting devices. So I click. We need, first of all, we need a count variable somewhere. Should be maybe a global variable. Starts at zero, right? To keep track of our counters count. We'll put that in the .cpp file because that's where implementations go. It's technically an implementation. Just a global variable. We'll start it at zero, right? Maybe we'll have an initialization function to do that. Initialization. That'll make sense soon. Uh, We'll only ever initialize our count once at the very beginning of our program before we use our counter, right? And then we'll have a increment function that takes that, uh, that goes to that global count variable and increments it, increments it to whatever uh, it used to be plus one. So you call increment once, it makes it one. Increment again, it makes it two. You can also make an uh, make a decrement function if you'd like that takes that global variable and decreases it by one. So this is us modeling a counter with a bunch of functions. Maybe we can make a reset uh, function that will reset our count's uh, value to zero. Though init counter would have done the same thing. We're just going to pretend that we only ever initialize our counter once with the init function. And then finally, this is a library, so the user doesn't have access to the secret variable that we're using. It'll be in our CPP file. They can't get it. It's not in the header file. So we will give them access to the value of that variable with a get count function. Okay, that's how they'll retrieve whatever the value of the counter is, right? So those are the ideas. Those are the little functions that we'll make in the global variable that we'll make. Here's what we need. We need, in our header file, we're just going to spell out exactly what we're going to have. We have an init counter function, and then we can start using inc and dec and reset and get count, all those things. That'll be our library. Okay, so let's make that. Uh, I'll make another folder for this. Make dir counter be our counter library. Boop. And so let's start with our header file, counter.h. That's what I want to call it, yeah? Yeah. So remember your header file guards. Boop. And then you can declare that all these exist. We need a init counter. These all need semicolons. The thing that I wanted to do. There. Init counter just initializes our counter, doesn't give back anything. Inc just increments our counter, doesn't give back anything. Same with dec. Same with reset. The only thing that gives back something is our get count function. That will give back the current value of our counter to the user. So this is how the user gets to interact with our library, with these functions. They better call init counter first. Alright. Now, Let's have our main.cpp file that includes this library. Oops. Whee. And so this will include our library. So include counter.h. And here's what I can do with my counter now. I can say, I don't know, init counter. That will initialize my counter to zero, right? I'm always supposed to do that first. And then I can call inc a few times, like inc, inc, inc. That will make it three, right? We'll make our count three. 
then call deck. Now I'll make our count two, and then I can see out the count, get count. Isn't that cool? We can make a library that just models a counter. It'll keep track of the count. We can call get count to get it whenever we need it. So this should print two. Do we understand why it should print two? It's a very fancy program that prints two. Are we ready to implement the counter library? So we take the header file and we implement all these things in the corresponding CPP file. Customarily, we include our header file. We don't really need to. And then also in our CPP file, we have our global variable that keeps track of our count. So int count. Just for us. Just for our library. The user doesn't get to see count. They can't even access it. We don't show them in the header file. And then the rest of these, they kind of implement themselves, right? I have this count variable. It's global. Anybody can talk to it. Init counter better make it zero. Same with reset. Reset better also make it zero. These are different functions for a reason that we'll get into in a future class. And then inc takes our count, our global variable count, and increments it, right? Count plus plus. Dec takes our count variable, decrements it. Count minus minus. Get count takes our count variable and gives it to the user because they can't access it. It's not in their scoop. It's in ours. Return count. So these are pretty natural implementations of all these things. Are we good with them? Do they make sense? This is just the counter library, the implementations of them. And all these things, we promised to implement them. We promised them the header file. There's our count global variable, and there's a net counter, ink, and deck, and reset, and get count. Yeah? Are we happy with those? Because now, I go to main.cvp, it's going to include our library and start using them. We call init counter to make it zero, ink, ink, ink to make it three, deck to make the count two, and then get count to return whatever our count global variable holds. And so the user is interacting with this library in the way we told them that they can. They are only able to see these functions. Those are the only ones we told them about. We could technically write more in our .cpp file, and the user has no clue about them because they can only see what was in the header file. That's quite nice. But this will all compile. G++ main.cpp uh, counter. Oh, shoot. Sorry, i got to get into that folder. G++ main.cpp. So I have those three files now, right? G++ main.cpp counter.cpp. No need to give the header file because it's getting copied and pasted. Don't need it. There's no, there's no implementation there anyway. Call it main. And what do you know it prints to? Okay. Are there any questions about what we just did? Again, I can try and show you everything at once. There's the main file. There is the header file that said what is there. It's the main file including our library and starting to use it. And then here's the implementation of all the things that we promised to implement in our header file. That's the library implementation. The header file and the CPP file go hand in hand. They make the library. And then we can include the library's header file and start using it. So long as when we compile, we give the implementation file there. Are we okay with that? It's going to take a while to sink in. It's a new little concept. But I hope it's starting to make at least a little bit of sense. This is how you split up your programs into logical bite-sized chunks of a bunch of functions that should all be together. Okay? So that's that idea. And then I think we're running a little bit over, so let me just do this for you. All right? Let's write a test for our counter library using assert true. So let's test that what we just did will give back two. Right? Let's test the fact that running a knit counter, then ink three times, then deck, then get count in that order should return two. So here's how we'll do it. I can make a separate testing library if I wanted to. Let's go to main.cvp and let's uh, let's take all of these and put them in a test. Let's be like test counter. 
and here's how we'll do it. We'll, we'll need our assert true function, which I would really like to steal right now from somewhere. So I wonder if I can do this. Like 11 testing. No, oh, sorry. Two folders out, like 11. Do I have a testing program? Yeah, I do. Testing.cpp. Give me that. Give me my assert true, please. Yeah. Take that. Put it here. Yay. And so let me get out of that file now. So back to main.cpp that now has an assert true function in it. Then I'll make a test counter function that runs a single test. It runs all these things and checks that it all worked out, right? So test counter. We'll run all these functions, except for the C out. Instead of that, I want to just make sure, right, after doing all these things, that the count is two now. So I will let's try and get this all on the same screen for you. I will assert true that calling get count right now, after all these things above it, better give me back two, right? I'll just call this counter test or something in the description. But that is a nice looking test. Does it make sense why it's a test? Why it's testing something? It's running a bunch of stuff and then making sure that what we expect to have happen after all those things have been finished is exactly equal to what we uh, got, right? This is what we're getting back. It's whatever get, get count gives us. It better be equal to two. That's what it should have been when we ran it in our minds, okay? We ran the program in our head to make it all work. So that will be a nice little test. And it should pass. So compile separately together dot slash main passed counter test. It, it really did give back two here. And so that's a nice passing test for us to gain confidence in our counter library implementation. All right. So again, CVV file that included our header file and started using stuff. And then we had the header file that declared all the things and the CPP file that implemented all the declared things, plus some extra stuff that we don't even let the user see, just for us, just for our implementation, like our count global variable. Okay. Any last questions about any of this stuff? Are you good with it? Maybe we need to study it a little bit once I post the, the code. But that is a bunch of new stuff. We can now make fancier programs. If we're doing all right, I think that's everything that I wanted to say. Um, yeah, nothing new this week. No new labs or anything. That would have been on Thursday anyway. So that is officially all that I want to record.